Guess what? It may have occurred nearly 700 years ago, but scientists have discovered that the long-term effects of the Black Death are so profound that this medieval plague is still impacting us even today. Stay tuned to this week's video from History Calling to find out what they learned when they dug up and analysed hundreds of plague victims and how the Black Death affects you. There has been some dispute as to exactly where the Black Death originated. Some think it was China, others that it emerged in what is now northern Kyrgyzstan. When it emerged is also up for debate. 1346 is the most widely agreed upon year, but in 2022 an article released in the Nature Journal contained fresh research carried out on seven skeletons discovered in Kyrgyzstan in the 19th century and since stored in Russia. Tombstones showed that some of these skeletons were buried in the years 1338 and 1339, and some recorded that the dead had expired from pestilence. After DNA analysis, it was established that three had died from the illness now called the Black Death. If these individuals were indeed ground zero for the sickness, then that pushes its start date back an extra eight years. Wherever and whenever it began, though, it didn't stay there. By the mid-1350s, it had spread through Asia, Europe and North Africa, producing one of the most devastating natural selection events in human history. Given the lack of historical records created and kept from this time, it's impossible to say with much accuracy how many people the Black Death killed. But depending on which estimate you read, it wiped out 30 to 60% of those it infected, massively reducing the human population by anything up to around 50 million people. Remote areas with low population densities like Finland and Iceland were largely spared, but they were the exception. For most people, there was nowhere to hide. All they could do was watch in horror as hundreds and then thousands of people died around them, burying the bodies, praying for mercy, and waiting to fall ill in their turn. One Florentine chronicler wrote that the corpses were buried in mass graves, layered on top of one another with a thin layer of earth in between, quote, just as one makes lasagna with layers of pasta and cheese. It's little wonder that this pestilence is often called the deadliest plague in our history. It is caused by the Yersinia pestis bacterium, so named because one of the French scientists who discovered and classified it was surnamed Yersin. This bacterium started with rats and infected the fleas living on their bodies. When their rodent hosts died, the fleas moved to humans instead. The land and sea trading routes in use at the time allowed the pestilence to spread through the three connected continents and by the time people realised what was happening, it was too late. The cat, or should that be the rat, was out of the bag and humanity had a catastrophic pandemic on its hands. The symptoms could be excruciatingly painful. The Black Death is referred to as bubonic plague because it causes buboes to appear on the body when lymph nodes become infected with the plague bacterium and swell up, just as you see on this 20th century victim. And yes, before you ask, it is indeed still possible to be infected with Yersinia pestis today, but fortunately treatment options are much better. A fever was also common, as were black spots on the skin, bad headaches and nausea. Some argue that it was these black spots which led to the name Black Death, however, this is contested. Historian Ole J. Benedicto, and I'll leave his book and an article he wrote linked below, says that in fact the name probably stems from, quote, a mistranslation of the Latin expression atra mors, in which atra may mean both terrible and black. It has nothing to do with clinical symptoms or features, as persons seeking a rational explanation for this graphic term often believe, end quote. The common use of the name also long postdates the pandemic it describes. Benedicto tells us that other than one isolated case in the account of a doctor named Simon of Couvin, which is a town in Belgium, the term Black Death was not used during the 14th century and only gained traction in the 17th. Whatever its name, it was a terrifying illness. From the onset of symptoms to death typically only took a few days. Unlike other plagues, the victims of the Black Death who succumbed to the disease were not mainly from amongst the elderly. 
Your chance of dying did increase if you were in an older age cohort, but it also decimated a huge portion of the breeding age section of humanity as well. Nor did it spare the wealthy, despite their access to better diets and housing and easier lifestyles which might have made them healthier and more resistant to serious illness. Princess Joan of England, the 14-year-old daughter of Edward III, was one notable victim, for instance. Whilst travelling to Castile in 1345 to be married to Prince Pedro, son and heir of Alfonso XI, the girl contracted the Black Death and died in the village of Loremo in France. Her would-be father-in-law was another victim, dying at Gibraltar in 1350 at the age of 38. The fact that the disease relied on rats and fleas so much meant that outbreaks typically subsided during the winter months, when these creatures and insects would decrease in number. And Benedicto has convincingly shown that the Black Death did comparatively little of its spreading via human coughs and sneezes, a type of infection known as pneumonic plague. He says that... The bloodstream of humans is not invaded by plague bacteria from the buboes, or people die with so few bacteria in the blood that blood-sucking human parasites become insufficiently infected to become infective and spread the disease. The blood of plague-infected rats contains 500 to 1,000 times more bacteria per unit of measurement than the blood of plague-infected humans. Had the plague been spread in large part by human-to-human -human transmission via droplets in the air, it would have continued to prosper in the winter as well. That said, Benedicto notes in his book that those who were infected with pneumonic plague almost invariably died. This outbreak of plague petered out in the 1350s, though there continued to be sporadic eruptions of it across the three continents for centuries to come. If you want more information on these, see my video on how it affected the English village of Eme in the mid-1660s, where you can hear about the heroic measures the villagers took to try to contain it and the terrible price they paid. It has been centuries since the world suffered massive bubonic plague events of the type seen in the 1340s and 50s, or even the 1660s though. So how is it that we are still experiencing the after-effects of this illness en masse today? How does the Black Death affect you? Before I get to that, if you're enjoying this content and would like more history delivered straight to you, please remember to hit the like and subscribe buttons under this video and switch on the notification bell so that YouTube lets you know when I upload. If you want even more from History Calling, you can follow me on Instagram and Patreon, where I share bonus material including mini podcasts and early access to ad-free videos. While I'm on that topic, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank my wonderful patrons for their support and those of you who donate to the channel using the thanks button beneath videos as it helps me to make this a full-time career. The answer to the question of how the Black Death still affects us today was published by a team of scientists in October 2022, also in the journal Nature, though this is a different article to the one I discussed a few minutes ago. I'll leave both linked below, though I should warn you that they're a tough read for anyone like myself who doesn't come from a science background. The scientists behind the October article studied the exhumed skeletons of 516 individuals from England and Denmark and, using things like carbon dating and historical records, grouped them into cohorts who lived before the Black Death and after. Some were even exhumed from the famous Plague Cemetery of East Smithfield in London, and their deaths could be dated to during the pandemic itself. Of these 516, they found they had 360 whose bones produced sufficient DNA for analysis. They then tested said remains and obtained some fascinating results. Historians and the world of medicine had long wondered why the Black Death killed some people and not others, and the answer seems to lie in the genes they inherited from their parents. The team examining the DNA were looking for certain alleles that were found more frequently in the remains of people who lived after the Black Death, which would suggest that those alleles offered protection from the disease and that's why they were more prevalent after it had hit England and Denmark. They were also looking for alleles which were more prevalent only in those people who lived before the pestilence, which would indicate the opposite, that these alleles made one more susceptible to the illness and so decreased in frequency after the plague because those who carried them were more likely to die and be unable to pass on their genes to future generations. They found what they were looking for. Certain infection-fighting genes were indeed more common in the bones of those generations immediately following the Black Death than those who lived before it. 
Furthermore, the difference was so stark and had happened so quickly that it couldn't be accounted for by any other evolutionary process. It had to be the impact of the disease. This fitted with other observations about the plague more generally. The scientists had already suggested that the continued outbreaks of plague over the following centuries, which gradually killed fewer people for the most part, could be accounted for in part by, quote, human genetic adaptation to Y. pestis, end quote. And this is exactly what their research found. People who were naturally more likely to survive the plague did, then passed on their tougher genes to the next generation. Over the course of hundreds of years, this made it harder and harder for the bubonic plague to wipe out huge numbers of the human population. Now you might be thinking, this all seems great. Those of us alive today with European, Asian and North African heritage are pre-programmed to be more immune to this type of plague because we're descended from those people who proved able to survive it. And that's what History Calling meant when she said that the Black Death is still affecting us today. But there's more to come. And the next revelation is far less positive. The scientists also discovered that the very genes which are offering us some protection from bubonic plague also have another far less friendly effect. They make us more susceptible to autoimmune diseases such as Crohn's and lupus. Now for those of you who are, for example, Native Americans with no European, Asian or North African ancestry, this is no big deal. You can now sit back and enjoy a smug smile as you won't be affected by the long-term problems associated with this particular plague. However, in this day and age, I'd say that there are very few people who don't have any ancestors post-1346 from anywhere in the affected areas, so I think this is a bit of a bummer for the vast majority of us. It does go to show one of my personal maxims, however, which is that no matter what some people obsessed only with the here and now may claim, whether we like it or not, history matters. And on that note, my friends, that brings us to the end of another video. Let me know in the comments below what you think the worst part of being alive during the Black Death outbreak would have been. Watching others die, burying the bodies, waiting for your own infection, or something else. If you'd like to know more about plague history, try one of these options next. Whatever you choose, please enjoy, and until next time, keep learning.